In today's episode, we'll learn some built-in gutter basics from Jason Lamb. And later, Joe Thornton, a second-generation master thatcher, is here to talk about this trade, which dates back thousands of years. But first... I'm Stacey Grinsfelder from Blake Hill House, and I'm the host of True Tales from Old Houses. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Holy heat wave. The weather has been nutso all over, and I hope that all of you are doing okay. It is such a weird time of year. Fires, floods, and here in the Northeast, we could be wearing a light sweater on Monday and barely sleeping because of the heat on a Tuesday. And it often feels like there is just no rhyme or reason for any of it. June is half over, and I just planted my raised garden beds. I'm sure some of you are already harvesting tomatoes. I'm months away from that. Now, truthfully, I could have planted a couple weeks ago, but I didn't get to it. You know how it is. So before we get too far into today's episode, I want to offer an apology for the sound quality of some of the interviews this season, including today's. It's funny because during the first few seasons, my goals were to A, learn to talk to people, and B, improve the sound quality. And I think we did that pretty well. Now, nearly 80 episodes in, I'm having sound quality issues again. It is so frustrating as the host, and I am sure it's frustrating sometimes for you as a listener. If this show had support staff, we would all just sit down and work our way through this tech stuff. Instead, it's just me doing my best with what I have at my disposal and at this moment. I do have a wonderful sound tech person who does his best to clean up the tracks, but if you put lipstick on a pig, it is still a pig. (laughs) Anyway, I bring this up first to thank you for putting up with less than ideal sound quality. And second, I wanted to let you know that I am committed to making it better. After today, there are only two episodes left this season. I recorded one in person in Florida and the other one remotely. I'm already working on season eight, which includes implementing solutions to improve the tracks, especially the ones recorded remotely. So if you've been thinking that things are going downhill around here, I hope that you can be patient just a little bit longer. It will get better. I'll make it happen. Okay, now it's time to catch you up on a few things around here. The roofing project is complete. All of the porches and the Oreo window got new shingles. Actually, everything was torn off and redone completely, including a very bad patch from a few years ago. I also had the siding shingles on the sleeping porch replaced, and it's kind of a long story, So I wrote about it on the blog, and you can go right to BlakeHillHouse.com to read about it and see the photos, but I linked the article on the show notes too. What else? Oh, (laughs) the bathroom remodel. That is limping along, but Hot Sash Window Summer is in full swing. I talked about that during last episode. Quick recap, this summer I've planned 12 weeks of window restoration content across Instagram, my blog, Facebook, YouTube, right here on the podcast. And there is some exclusive stuff for Patreon subscribers. I keep meaning to tell you all about Patreon, but I haven't had a chance yet. I'll try to get to it next episode. In the meantime, I will link to Patreon on the show notes so you can find out more about it. We're already in week three of Hot Sash Window Summer, and I'm trying to curate everything on the Blake Hill House blog week by week just to make it easier to find all of it. So if you're interested and want to check it out, the best place to start is again, BlakeHillHouse.com. And finally, last Friday's Instagram live session is available now. I talked to Jessica Rhodes, who owns a giant, I think it's a second empire style home. We talked about making trade-offs and hard decisions when it comes to a project that size. Very relatable. You can watch our discussion on both Instagram and the True Tales from Old Houses Facebook group. The next Instagram live session is a little off schedule. I'm skipping the Friday before the 4th of July and moving it to Friday, July 8th, at 8 p.m. Eastern. And that will also be the last Instagram Live in this series because I'm going to be in Scotland and Ireland after that. Earlier this season, I talked about hosting that tour and it's finally time for it to happen. It felt months and months away when I was talking about it earlier. Some of you are joining me and if you're thinking, wait, what? I I would have gone too. Well, hopefully I'll have the opportunity to host another tour. I'm lobbying hard for one that goes to the Canadian Maritimes and I'll be sure to keep all of you in the loop. I think that's it. I always tell myself to keep this segment short, and then I just don't. (laughs) Listener Q&A is up next. (laughs) 
My guest for Q&A today is Jason Lamb. Hi, Jason. Welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. You were a guest way back on episode 20, and that was in November of 2019. It feels like a lifetime ago. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was. That was pre-pandemic times. That was a whole different time. Yeah, like we could only go back, right? You're here today because I had a question and I only know surface facts about how to answer this question. So I thought, well, you'd be really good at it because you've got, in the last few years, a ton of DIY experience and your neighbors have been hiring you to work on this very project, if I'm correct. Yeah, I sort of took a, a deep dive into this topic. Uh, not not a professional roofer. Oh, I should tell people what the question is, what the topic is. Oh, yes. I'm getting ahead of myself here. <laughs> All right. We're putting the, the cart before the horse here. But the topic is built in gutters. And I don't have a specific one question. We're just going to spend our Q&A time talking about built in gutters because a lot of people have inherited these good ones, bad ones, in perfect condition, states of disrepair, you name it. And you're going to shed some light on this situation. But yeah, quickly tell us, how did you get involved in this? Just real quick. Well, my house has 200 linear feet of built-in gutter. And uh, actually, when my home inspector, uh, home inspectors don't, a lot of the time, they don't know anything about these things. So he looked out the attic window and said, oh, it looks like copper. You're good. And were you good? No, no. Uh, it, it, it needed full restoration. And I ended up taking a deep dive. I mean, seriously, spent maybe a year or two reading everything that exists online talking to some of the best professionals in the world or in the country, meeting them, hanging out with them, working with them, and hiring some of them for consultations. And it's not something that folks can really, you know, you just can't do a quick Google search and, and get spun up on this. It's, it's, it's complicated. Uh, every house is different. The materials are expensive. It's a lot of labor. And a lot of professionals doing this work get it wrong. Well, so far you're making it sound really delightful. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to paint a rosy picture. Uh, you know, you got to be real about this, but um, no, I think that's important too. All right, well, let's walk back just a little bit. And why could you tell us why houses even have gutters? Well, uh, the bigger your roof, the more water it's got to get off of the roof. So you got to get all of that rain off the roof and get it onto the ground and get it away from your foundation, really. So that, that's, the, that's the, the main thing. Right. So splashback can wear away at your foundation, but also it can soak into the ground and then end up in your basement. So the quicker you can get it off the roof, and like you said, down to the ground, but away from the house, all the better. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you've got a wet basement, they call it hydro, hydrostatic pressure. That water will push against that foundation and it'll come through. It'll come through brick. It'll come through block. You just got to get it away from the house because that's public enemy number one. Exactly. And there are different types of gutters. There's what we see now today, modern aluminum gutters. There's half round, I think, which traditionally were copper. Now they're aluminum. Something called Yankee gutters, which are built into the roof. But we're specifically going to talk about built-in gutters called, I guess, I, I've known them as box gutters. Is that correct? I've heard them called box gutters, built-in gutters. And a lot of times you'll hear people use the term Yankee gutter, referring to a built-in gutter, uh, but they'll use that term incorrectly. So your your definition is right. Okay. We're not going to talk really about Yankee gutters, but if you hear somebody call a built-in or a box gutter a Yankee gutter, just know they might be talking about apples and oranges. So double check that. Yep. But a built-in gutter is actually part of the architecture of a house. It's You don't see it as a gutter. You see it really as part of the cornice, if I understand that correctly. And the cornice, of course, is basically the decorative molding on your house. Well, uh, if you want to get snobbish about it, you could, I guess you could call that whole assembly the entablature. Uh, I think the, the cornice is technically the, the uppermost crown molding sort of part of that. And yeah, you're right. It's just, it's just a big, chunky set of woodwork that has a, a, a top shaped like a gutter, and it's lined in sheet metal. What was the original material they were lined with? Because we didn't have sheet metal back in the day, right? Well, it would have been a tin. I, I call it a tin. It's it's steel. Well, actually, the technical term would be uh, turn metal. It's T-E-R-N-E. -E. It's a light gauge steel 
with a coating of lead and tin. I think it's like 80, 20, 50, 50. I'm not sure. And, you know, it had to be painted. Back then, labor was cheap. You could pay a kid a nickel to go up and repaint your gutter. It wasn't a big deal. But w- one thing to note is that you got to be careful reading old publications about doing this work because they use material that doesn't behave like modern material. Could somebody, in theory, still have functioning box gutters that don't have any issues that are still lined with lead? Is that something that someone might find today? Yeah, yeah, it's rare, but uh, I, th- I suppose that could be. There's, I mean, there's a lot of tin roofs that that are original that just you care for it, you paint it. It's really good stuff. It lasts a long time as long as you care for it. Were they ever lined with copper? Uh, they were, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't really have a any hard metrics on like how many here in the United States, but uh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of very old copper work that's uh, still kicking. And I would assume that something like a built-in gutter could handle a lot more rain than a modern gutter. That's true. Uh, I've, I've got a mid-sized gutter. You could, you could sit in it and watch a parade go by. <laughs> now I'd like to. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there, there are s- smaller ones. I mean, it just depends on the size of your roof. But uh, I've seen them big enough to take a bath in. You know, it just depends on the size of the building. But they are de- generally pretty high capacity compared to even a largest, largish, like a K-style gutter you'd buy. I think the largest that k- I've seen in the just regular house gutters, the K-style is six inch. Maybe there's something bigger on a for a public building or something, but for a home, I think six inches is pretty, as big as it gets. Yeah, and it gets pretty crazy because they're, well, they're hanging gutters. And it's hard, hard to keep them in place and they're, they're hanging off the edge of your house. Well, now that we've established what built-in gutters are, a lot of times people are struggling with the problems and they want to get rid of them because they're having difficulties. So what happens when box gutters fail? What are sort of the telltale signs that they're leaking? Now, obviously leaking where you can see it is correct, but do they always leak on the exterior? Could they be leaking somewhere in a secret location inside? Most built-in gutters well, let me let me tell you about the exception first. I've seen built-in gutters that are on the inside of a parapet wall, meaning when they leak, you've got water coming inside the building. And you better tell us what a parapet wall is real quick. Um, parapet wall, meaning like the exterior walls of the house come up above the roof. And then you have inside of that, you'd have a built-in gutter. And then inside that, you'd have a roof, a hip roof. Okay. That's some high stakes gutter work there because you know it's, it's coming right in the house. Most of the time you'll see rotten wood in your entablature. Yeah, that's a pretty sure sign that something's leaking. That would be a good first sign. There was another part of your question that I kind of forgot. So you just described, I guess, some of the telltale signs that they're leaking, but what happens when they fail? What's kind of the worst case scenario? Yes. Well, all right, let me I'll give you and I can I can look around my 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 neighborhood and give you pretty much three or four of the scenarios that your listeners are probably faced with. I've got one lady next door to me. Her gutters were done. They were done right probably 40 years ago. They're still working like a champ. Set it, forget it. She's good. Her grandkids won't need to mess with that. I've got a guy down the street from me. His gutters were probably done in the mid 80s. They were done in soft copper. The solder joints aren't very good. Many of them were leaking or split open. So he's got kind of a a bad situation in that there's not a lot of ways that you can button that up. Just to say, to answer your question, that there's numerous scenarios that might that people might have, some of which could be patched, most of which are probably a total redo. What are some really terrible ways that roofers try to repair them? What have you seen? I'm picturing someone going up there with that black tar spray and just (laughs) spraying it all over. Right. The petrochemical goo is is kind of a band-aid and it. It's not going to last. I mean, UV light's going to break it down. It's going to split open. It's riding on top of metal that's going to move around. I've seen them lined in, in EPDM or some sort of rubber membrane. That's not ideal, but it can buy you some time. It can buy you 10 or 15 years, maybe at best. So what are some acceptable lining products that will work well? And last, I mean, I guess maybe band aids, but also, what do you really want for a complete fix? What should somebody do? So let's talk about band aids first. Band aids 
uh, there, well, there's a product called Eternal Bond. It's a tape. It's got this uh, silvery foil backer so that UV light doesn't break it down. I actually had a piece on a section of my gutter. I don't know when it was put down, years and years and years ago. I couldn't put, pull, pull it off for anything. If you have a small gash in something, that'll work. Resoldering copper is tricky because you got to really scrape off that patina, get it bright. Um, it can be done, but soldering old copper is, is tricky. Beyond Band-Aids, what should, if you're getting your box gutters done, what are you looking for in a roofer? What do you want to hear from a roofer who's getting ready to repair your box gutters? This is probably going to be a, a bonkers answer for people to swallow, but I think they need to study this stuff deeply in order to know what they're getting. Because, I mean, this stuff is out of sight, out of mind. You know, most people aren't going to be climbing up there inspecting their rivets, you know, oh, are these, uh, are these rivets uh, copper with brass mandrels or uh, are you trying to give me copper plated rivets that are steel inside and those are going to galvanically react to the copper gutter and I'll end up with holes in my gutter after 10 years? Just that's a dumb example, but it happens. You don't know how they're detailing this thing. You're, it's a big risk because you're spending at the time it was 150 a linear foot for this work. And that's probably way higher now. Would you be willing to maybe write down some questions and the answers that should follow for people who might be getting bids on having their built-in gutters fixed? Yes. That would be great because you were just describing things like the rivets and the mandrels and sometimes just sounding like you know what you're talking about is half the battle when it comes to interviewing someone who's willing to do the work. Yeah. And well, you know this, and most of your listeners will probably know this, but when you, you know, you hire somebody to do something then, and they say stuff like, well, we've always done it like that. We always run ours like this. And, you know, you're just a little homeowner lady. We're, we're the big professional guys, you know. My favorite thing is when I tell them what I want and they say, why do you want that? No, I just told you what I wanted. Like, I don't really have to justify why I want that thing. This is what I asked for. Can you right. do that? <laughs> so, yeah, definitely. And I would even suggest that folks, like if you can't hire the best person in the world, get some of the best people to detail the project for you and dictate how it should be done. And then you can just hire the fabricator and say, this is what kind of rivets you want. This is what kind of seams I want to see. I want to see an, an example of your soldering. This is how the downspouts need to be located. And you, you have control and, and you know what you're getting. That's a really good suggestion. I think somewhat under outside of some people's comfort zone, but I would urge listeners to, to try that. I, I think that's such a great idea, Jason, and really just owning what you want and learning about it to a certain capacity and then hiring that person to carry out the job. Well, that's kind of what I did. I I told you I'm, I've met some of the best people in the country. In lieu of hiring him for to come down and me spend a hundred grand, I paid him to draw up plans and dictate exactly how I should detail some of these weird things going on at my house. And I just acted as the fabricator. This is a really detailed topic, and of course, you are an extremely detailed person. So we could go on and on for a long, long time, but we don't have a lot of time during the segment. So if you want to write any of that down, sort of a companion blog piece, and you that's a big ask. So I don't expect you to have it done before this comes out in just a few days. Well, the, the good news is I write much better than I talk, so that might work out better. I like hearing you talk, and I think the two pieces together will work really well for people who are considering what to do with their box gutters or finding finding a big project on their hands that they don't know how to move forward on. And I guess the last thing I'd want to ask you today before we wrap up is, is there any reason why sometimes I have people who ask me or tell me they want to actually just re-roof and get rid of the box gutters altogether? Is there a good reason to do that? I, I kind of understand why people would want to, uh, I mean, not knowing how to do the box gutter work, I, I understand how they would want to just, you know, they've got this notion that, oh, they're just problematic things and let's just get rid of them and get something new. The, the problem is, well, you're not only downgrading your house, it would require like 
you're going to have to take some roofing up. You're going to have to frame over where the box gutter was. Your trim work on your house uh, in that big entablature, you're going to need to have a place for hanging gutters to fit into. And a lot of times your gutter will be like too far out from the roof. And anybody who can do that well should be good enough to do the box gutter work well. So I don't, I don't really see, I don't think it would make financial sense. Um, and I don't, I don't see the point, really. I have the case style. I, I think you're just trade one problem for another. If there's no bigger reason than you just explained, then maybe I would just counsel people to, to really think it through. Yeah. Um, I mean, um, there might be a few old houses that that would work with, but you know where I stand on it. I, I say we do it, we do it right. And, and it shouldn't be anything that you would ever have to think about again. If you do this work right, your grandkids shouldn't have to think about it. It's, it's going to be maintenance free. That's a great endorsement. It's always great to see you and talk to you. And I appreciate your thoughts on built in gutters. Thanks for having me. If you have an old house or DIY question that you would like for me and a guest to answer on an upcoming episode, please contact the show via the True Tales from Old Houses website or send me a direct message on Facebook or Instagram. Now it's your turn. I want to know what have you learned since buying your old house? Here are a couple of your answers from Instagram. Kristen says, lead paint is a given, but it's not going to spontaneously leach into you. And then on the flip side of that, Alyssa says, Renovating with small kids in a house with lead paint is super hard when it's not impossible. And Christian is right, but Alyssa's right too. There certainly is a lot to think about when it comes to lead paint safety and your precious families and neighbors. If you would like to share an answer to this season's question, go ahead and send me a direct message through social media or head on over to truetalesfromoldhouses.com and let me know via the contact form. Or click on the mic icon in the bottom right-hand corner to leave a voicemail using your phone or computer. Once again, the question is, what have you learned since buying your old house? It's a break time because I want to thank our sponsors, handpicked just for you. True Tales from Old Houses continues because of their generous support. So thank you to the window course from Scott Seidler of the Craftsman blog, Abitron, and for this episode, Limeworks US. The window course is a step-by-step, do-it-yourself window restoration program that will teach you everything you need to know to successfully restore your wood windows. I offer window restoration information in bits and pieces, but the window course offers you all of the instruction you need right at your fingertips right now. Hands down, Scott is one of the best teachers in the biz, and I have learned so much from him over the years. One of the best things about buying the window course is that it's yours to keep. You own it. And if you're working on a window and get stuck, you can go back and review as many times as necessary. No more digging through YouTube trying to figure out which resources are the real deal. Learn from the best. Learn from a pro. The window course is self-paced, so you can go as fast or as slow as you need to. And there are several price points to fit your needs and budget. If you sign up for the lifetime access package or training package, then you'll get a free infrared paint remover, which is a $130 value. The window course is offered with a money back guarantee, and I've got a coupon code to share. Scott is offering True Tales from Old Houses listeners a special discount. For 10% off, visit thewindowcourse.com and use the coupon code True Tales. True Tales from Old Houses is also supported by Abitron. Abitron manufactures two of my very favorite wood repair products, liquid wood and wood epox. If you came to my workshop right now, you would find liquid wood and wood epox on the shelf. Over the years, I've talked about both on Instagram and my blog, and I'll be using wood epox and liquid wood throughout the summer to repair doors, windows, and even some sections of exterior crown molding. Wood epox is tintable, paintable, even moldable. In fact, I used it to sculpt some new feet for a desk in my daughter's room. And no one can tell the difference between the original feet and the ones I made. Woody Box and Liquid Wood make permanent cost-effective repairs anywhere you find rotted or damaged wood. And whether you're a first-timer or a professional tradesperson, Abitron products are super easy to use. The instructions are simple. The results are exceptional. No shrinking or sagging. And remember, the repairs can be sanded and painted just like wood. 
Follow Abitron on Facebook and Instagram. You'll find them at Abitron Inc. as in Incorporated. To purchase liquid wood and wood epochs, visit Abitron.com. Use the coupon code TRUETALES10, that's the number 10, to save 10% on your order. And finally, True Tales from Old Houses is also supported by Limeworks US. If your masonry or stonework needs a little attention, head on over to Limeworks.us. Limeworks offers products for masonry and plaster repair, as well as education to preserve the legacy of historic structures from cathedrals to cottages, all while maintaining a commitment to reducing the carbon footprint for everyone. A couple of years ago, my friend John Rogers, who's been on this podcast several times, directed me to Limeworks to purchase mortar to repoint my stone foundation here at Blake Hill House. I use their online tool to figure out which lime mortar I should buy. It's all very scientific based on your climate, interior or exterior use, even how hard or soft your stone or brick is. And they have this tool and you plug all that data in and it serves up personalized recommendations. Then if you still don't know what you need, you can contact customer service and they'll help you figure it out. All of Limeworks products are compatible with old buildings and buying from Limeworks supports their worthy goal of creating more American jobs and investing in an eco-friendly, energy-efficient, and sustainable future. Visit limeworks.us to learn more about their products and services for your next historic restoration project. My guest today is Joe Thornton. When I first saw Joe's work on Instagram, I thought, this can't be real. The thatched roof cottages look straight out of a fairy tale. I soon learned that the art and function of roof thatching go hand in hand. And as a master thatcher, Joe is one of the best of the best. Oh, hi, I'm Joe Thornton. I'm a master thatcher based in England, uh, Vale of Evesham in England. Um, I'm, you might know me on Village Thatcher on Instagram. I do know you, and welcome to True Tales from Old Houses. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, coincidentally, I have a roof project going on here at my house today, and they haven't arrived yet, but unfortunately, there might be a little banging and shouting in the background. So I'm imagining that thatching is a much quieter <laughs> job. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, I noticed that you've got that going on in your place, actually. It's yeah, quite a bit different to what we what we what we're doing. But yeah, we are what well, relatively quiet. Yeah, there's very few power tools that we use, so it's all hand hand. So it's yeah, it's quite quiet. I tell people that your Instagram is my happy place. Oh, that's very kind of you. Oh, it's lovely, and your work seems to me like the perfect marriage between art and design. And there are times when I need a little mental break, and I'll just spend time zooming in on your photos, just to appreciate the details. (laughs) It's so gorgeous. But every time I do, I think to myself, you know, how does thatching work? And how does Joe do that? So I thought that's maybe where we would start, uh, especially because here in the United States, we don't know a lot about thatching. So I wondered if, generally speaking, what are the basics of roof thatching? Uh, so yeah, you, you're quite right in, in terms of what what you're looking at from my from my work. That's how I sort of base myself. So I am kind of in between art and construction, really. So thatching is a very prominent um, part of the building. So I think it needs to resemble, you know, an artistic piece. We need to do it just just this in that sense. There, there is some examples of it in the United States actually, but there's there's very few and far between. Um, I've completely forgot what your question was actually. That's okay. Let me ask. <laughs> let me just ask you again. You're right. In the United States, there are very few examples. And now that after I've talked to you, I'm I'm dead set on finding one. So I will be looking, scouring the United States for one in real in person, yes. so that I can visit it. But generally speaking, what are the basic steps, like the layers, I suppose, of roof thatching? What's there? What makes it roof a roof? So basically, you've got the timber structure underneath, and from then onwards, you've got. Depending on what material you're using, so if you're using um, cone wheat straw, which is the traditional material for where I am locally in England, at the area of England, so I say cone wheat straw is the same wheat that you see grown in the field for grain, for your bread and everything else. It's just the old variety, um, which is before the advent of the combine harvester. So it's it's very long, uh, hasn't been modified for so many years. So it's basically put on straight on top of the timbers. The builders I'm working on, that process was done many hundreds of years ago. So I'm building on top of existing layers. The original, the original layer that I might be 
working upon, you can go into the attic space and quite often you can look up and see the original uh, thatch underneath. And, you know, that might be six, seven hundred years old. And that, that would have been originally fixed with split bramble. So they would have tied, they would have taken all the, all the barbs off the bramble, split it. And it's actually really tough string type material then. And they tied that round onto the rafters of the building. And that's how the, the first fix was put on back then. Wow. I'm sorry. I'm just in shock over this idea that the original layer is still there and it could be 600 years old. So I did hear everything else you said, but I admit my brain just was like, what? It just kind of blew up a little bit. I What? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it can't it can be older than that. I mean, I have done, I have done some, I did a, nor- a very old Norman church. The original sax on that was... It was the dooms- it was in the doomsday book the building was so we're talking you know, a very old 800 900 years ago and that's that was a grade one star listed building so I don't know if you're aware of in the UK but we have this grading system where the historic buildings are, are listed and there's a grade one a grade two listing and then it's grade one star which is basically very precious building you're really restricted on what you can do with it and most of such buildings they are grade grade two listing which is the standard one and so the thatch inside of things is is preserved so we, we can't really disturb any of the underneath layers so it's there for future generations to see exactly how it's constructed and, and with cone wheat straw that 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 is an important integral part of of the roof design and how it works anyway how it keeps watertight how it breathes how the material lasts Wow. So how thick is that layer of straw, for instance, from the bottom where it starts all the way to the top? How thick would that be? So I think thickness from timbers to the outside, I think you could you could probably say on average, it's probably two foot, two and a half foot thick um, on average. And they can be can be more than that. They can, they can be less, but generally on average, about two and a half foot thick. Interesting. So everything that you said pretty much a- answered some of my questions that I had here. Uh, but I mean, do you ever do a tear off? Do you ever have to do a complete tear off and just start over? Yeah, yeah. Cool. You know, not that often because thatching, the, the actual process of thatching actually preserves timbers underneath. So they're, they're very in good state. They might be the original timbers and they're, they're most probably large poles. And they'd be, you, you'll look in there and you'll think it was just, just branches of a tree holding the, holding the roof up which it probably was. It was just a local tree that they cut down and just used thicker branches. Um, but the, the way the thatching process is sat on top of it, it, it preserves those timbers. Sometimes more to do with the neglect of the building, they might get damp and then rot into that timber. So then we have to strip it off to replace it. But technically we're supposed to, when we get to that, we're supposed to apply for planning permission then to remove historical material. And it's, it's very few and far between really. With uh, water reed, which is a different material altogether, which is not so prominent where I am, but in certain parts of the UK it, it is used. And in fact, I think most of the examples I've seen in the States is use water reed rather than straw. That does get taken completely off um, and fixed directly back onto timbers. With the straw, I actually did have the questions about the straw. Is it grown directly in your area is there a surplus from year to year how does that work yeah so it's it's grown it's specialist for thatching it's grown fairly local to me it's within a sort of an hour and a half um it's north devon in the uk is where i get my material from and the south the southwest is a, is a big producer of the straw for thatching it's grown only for thatching the material that we use there is a bit of grain that's harvested from it um, it's not used for bread or anything like that. It goes for cattle feed if there is an extra. A lot of it gets reused. Sea so gets reused for the following year. In terms of whether there's surpluses or not, it, it's a tricky one because it's very weather dependent, really. We do have peaks and troughs in supply. So only a couple of years ago, we, we actually had a shortage of thatching straw where there was a failed crop. And so a lot of thatchers were struggling to get hold of the straw. And that was just to do with the weather. It's called winter wheat, so it's planted in the win- in the autumn, late autumn, sort of October time, and then it's harvested in sort of July-ish. And we had horrendous weather in October. It's very wet, so the farmers can get on the field to drill it. And then what they could do, it sort of the seed more or less rotted in the field. And then when it came to um, harvest time, well, it was spring, we didn't have any rain. It was very, very dry. 
so it was stunted growth. So it just caught it was just caused a shortage, and that it does happen. You know, that's probably the third time it's happened in my career, and I guess I guess in modern times it might happen more frequently. I, we don't know, really know. Well, I am a bit of a control seeker, and I spent some of my formative years growing up in farm country. So relying on the weather to influence a crop like this that felt risky to me. So I'm, I'm I was interested in hearing you address that because what do you? do do you just not take on as much work or do you really have to work hard at finding it from another source another location uh well, that was uk wide so there, there was no other there wasn't anywhere else we could go we are fortunate in some ways that we have two materials we've got straw material and then we've got the reed material um and a lot of guys they have sort of 50 50 mix um so they could just swap onto the reed jobs so the straw guys, they had to wait really for the harvest to come in. I ordered mine in as we had the harvest and the farm said to me, look, Joe, we've got a, we've got a shortage. You're limited to this amount this year. I, I have to spread it for all, all the other thatchers. And I had to just work my schedule around that really. So if you have to wait to work on a property for one year, obviously that hurts your business, that hurts your income, but does it hurt the house? Can it wait, can it wait a little? Yes and no. Yeah, you're quite right. It, it has a double double whammy effect. So it will be impacting businesses, but also will be impacting properties as well. We can do we can do redeem our work to keep it ticking over. It depends on how long they've let the roof go. And I would say, really, modern modern times, the last ten years, a lot of people are really looking after the properties. So they're not letting it go too far. Whereas when I first started roofing 20 years ago, you would get in people that um, were in the property. They were born and bred in the property. They had had the property for generations and they would let it go as long as possible to basically to save pennies. Do you find that a lot of people who own houses with thatched roofs, that you kind of answered my questions, but overall, do they have sort of pride of ownership? Is this what does a maintenance schedule look like? And are they wanting to preserve these properties as much as possible? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So 99% uh, of people are well aware of the process involved in the cost involved in thatches. So they, they would already contact me prior to purchasing it. And they, they you know, I'd give them a, a guide on what we need to be doing and a cost sort of a, a basic cost. So they know exactly how much to be setting aside because the roof doesn't need frequent maintenance. So the ornate piece on the top, the ridge, the pretty piece that everyone focuses on that sort of needs replacing every sort of 15 years and then the main body of the coat if it's straw it needs replacing every in my area every sort of 30 years it can be if you go down to devon it, it might be a lot less than that it's changed it has changed yeah because as i said it was the thatch properties were generally people that have been in there for generations but now there's a lot of houses moving that was originally a poor man's roof but now it's completely done 360 and it's now considered, you know, you're affluent if you have a thatch roof. Here in the U.S., building codes dictate materials that are fire resistant. And thatch doesn't make the cut, even though I know there are plenty of misconceptions about the risk. I mean, obviously, these houses have been there for 600 years, <laughs> some of them in some cases. So how is a thatched roof safer than we imagine? Yeah, it's... It's all, it's all down to the home ownership of the property, how we go about your day-to-day, -day, how you make it safe, basically. So it's things like open fires. If you have an open fire in, in your property, you need to make sure the chimney is, is nice and secure, all the brickwork is intact, um, it's it's lined. You, you need to make sure that the wiring in, inside the attic space is not touching any of the thatch at all inside, and it needs to be armoured cable in there, so you, you cut it, any rodent goes in there, doesn't and bite a little bit and it sparks and causes a fire that way. It's general common sense from the homeowner. Uh, it's very rare that a fire will start from the outside. And in fact, I don't I haven't really heard of any instance where a fire has started from the outside. It's always internally, and that's most of the time caused by a default chimney. If you keep an eye on that, that that's the key to it really. And as you said, you know, we've got examples of properties that have been six or seven hundred years thatched and they're still original. So it's not necessarily a big problem but it is a perceived problem i do have to sort of combat that quite often sure i mean there is there is certain fire precautions you can do from the outside there's a spray that you can put on the outside which is supposed to stop any kind of flame come com coming in i'm not sure whether it's it that's particularly beneficial product yeah 
the whole process of thatching is that it deteriorates as soon as I've finished. Unfortunately, it's rotting again because it's an organic natural material. So if you spray anything on the surface of it, it eventually it will fall off and rot off anyway. We do have new build thatching and the way we combat that is we, we put a fire barrier underneath the thatch on top of the timbers. So the, the, we have the whole timber frame, then there'll be a fire protection all the way around, then the thatch will be built on top of the fire protection. The thought process on this is that if there is a thatch fire, the, the actual thatch burns off independently of the rest of the building. Right. Okay, that makes sense. I'm picturing in the US if we've tried to get that by code or insurance, they'd say, sure, you can use it, but you have to have a fire hydrant every like five feet circling your house or something crazy like that. They'd have some sort of weird, odd regulation. But instead, I'm sure that it's only allowed in historic structures in the United States. But here we do have a handful of thatched roof houses. Again, I'm going to be searching for one. I've never seen one in person, but we do have something called false thatch here. And I'm wondering, you may or may not know about this. Is that a, do you think that was a replacement for traditional thatch or is that just something different altogether? It's basically shingles or something, but it's rolled. You know, it, it mimics a thatched roof. Um, Yes. Yeah. I have seen that. It's very pretty actually. There is one of those in my village and I admire it all the time. Yeah. No, I'm not really sure actually. It's probably an independent or reflecting back on the, the look of thatch. Um, It certainly has that thatch appeal, doesn't it? It certainly has that rounded look. So now that I've really exhausted sort of the basic nuts and bolts questions, I want to talk about your life as an artisan thatcher in the Cotswolds. Uh, Did I pronounce that correctly? I had to look that up too. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, good, good. It is a bit of a stereotype that Americans aren't really good at world geography, and I play into that stereotype perfectly since I am embarrassingly awful at identifying countries and regions outside of the United States. But where are the Cotswolds in England? And could you give us just a little history of the area, maybe as that relates, you know, why the structures are the way they are there? Yeah, so the, the Cotswolds is in, in the center of the country, and it's, it's, a, it's a line of hilly areas and um, it's the stone is, is a, it's a sandstone so it's a it's a yellow stone it's typically if you would see a, a photo of britain it would be that yellow stone that you, you see i am on the northern border of that of the cotswolds and it forms part of what they used to call the wheat belt in, in the uk so the wheat belt is a triangle um which sort of goes from devon across down to hampshire that's the sort of bottom of the triangle. Then the top of it is um, sort of Cheshire. Um, and that's predominantly where wheat was grown. And so where wheat was grown, the byproduct was the stem left over. And that's what they used then for the roof material. So traditionally, thatchers years ago would have would have thatched the roof after the harvest. So any cottages in the local village that needed doing straight after the harvest, they would have been repaired there and then. That's really interesting. I hadn't even thought about that because you were talking about how the wheat now is grown to thatch. But of course, it makes sense that you would use use every part of the wheat way back when. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I also read that you are a second generation thatcher. And what was your progression as an artisan craftsman? Did you ever want to pursue a different career? No. (laughs) Yeah. No, I've always I've always wanted to follow my, my dad into thatching. So I would work for my dad when I was at school. So I any kind of pocket money I'd want, then I'd go and have my dad in school holidays. And we were very lucky when I was growing up. We, we had a nice big house and we had a barn in the back. And all the dad's thatching straw was kept in that barn in the back. So I would as a as a very small child, I would be playing in those in those straw stacks and getting in trouble for ruining his material. But it was just <laughs> I just loved the being in there and it just that, that love just grew from there really. So as I when I left school I just worked for dad and uh, I just sort of followed through from there. Did he give you all the garbage work? Did you have to do all the sweeping and cleaning up and <laughs> picking up the garbage? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I did. He tried to put me off, but I was I was keen, yeah. So uh, and that's how all apprentices to start really. You, you sort of get the mundane tasks, laborious tasks, but it's all part and parcel of the job at at the end of the day. So, Right. You have to pay your dues. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I wanted to talk more about, too, the artistic side of your trade, you know, beyond after you have learned how to do the basics, because it all looks like art to me, even the most basic 
of that gene. But I guess specifically, I'm thinking about the ornate patterns on the ridge. And sometimes you make these adorable animal creatures or sculptures that I just can't get enough of. How did you learn how to do that? I mean, I've got to give my dad a lot of credit for this. So dad is very artistic and I'll obviously follow on from him. So I've taken a step from what my dad taught me. Um, and then I've tried to add my own interpretation and sort of move it forward how I think it should be. And I try and do things, I try and do things differently to a lot of other thatches. I try and put my own independent sort of stamp on the roofs. Um, I think, and I'm, a lot of thatches might disagree, but I think it's, it, that's a reflection of me, the, my personality on those roofs. I always work local. I don't work anywhere else. And I'd like to drive past, and I'm still proud of roofs that I've done you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they still look great. And it's just having that eye for detail, I think. And it's what gets me work. And it's what I love doing. And I've got an emotional investment in, in the job from having working with my father. So from an artistic point of view, you know, artists always say that they're trying to express parts themselves in their artistic work, whatever they're doing, if they're sculpting or painting. And that's true of what I'm doing with that chin. Well, your attention to detail and your artistic sensibilities, they show, I, I mean, I can't say for sure, but I feel like looking at different thatching accounts, I would recognize your work. The beginning, you know, I was still learning, but I think now after looking at, at many, I could say, oh, that's Joe's work. It's really beautiful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Is there any folklore or anything attached to the finishing touches that you do? There is with the animals. You mentioned the animals that we make. and um, The animals traditionally was there's a few schools of thought and what they were um a lot of people say it's just to, to scare off witches evil spirits and that's why they're on the roof um other people say it was trademark for, for thatcher and some people say it's, it was just to tell the people looked after you very well they gave you cups of tea then you put a roof they put an animal on the roof and then the uh, <laughs> the next thatcher would know that they were good to work for oh that's sweet i like that <laughs> there's a lot of tales behind it but at the moment, it, it's down to what the customer would like. I ask them whether they want an animal or they, they approach me and they say they would like an animal. And then we go through um, what animal would suit and what they would like and where I can make it or that kind of thing. I mean, I can pretty much make anything, but it's whether it, it will suit the roof. My dad told me to make the basic animals, the basic principles. So they kind of, they always start off in a very similar way and then they evolve into the, the different animals they are. And then I've sort, of, I've sort of brought that on a little bit further. You know, I've been playing with them. I like to play with them and try and add a bit more. Like recently, I've got ducklings and I've sort of added more sort of feathering to them. And I think that works well. And that's a sort of progression. I'm always trying to better. I'm always my worst own works critic. We all are. Yeah. That's always, I've got to improve upon my last one. Creatives are particularly hard on themselves, I've noticed. Yeah. I did see on your website where ducks and ducklings are your signature animal. How did you settle on that? Did it just seem fun and you tried it and then you've improved from there? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I, I did I did one or two and then it sort of followed on and people, people kind of liked it. And I've got a thing now where I've got three or four customers who, who have got older generation. They've got grandchildren. And so I have a duck. I have two ducks that represent two grandparents. And then the ducklings that follow are how many grandchildren they have. So I'm constantly making little ducklings to, if when they phone me up, Joe, we've had them, you know, really pleased we've had another grandchild. Can you make me a duckling? So <laughs> I quite enjoy that. What a nice representative of family life in the house. That's really beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, just like any trade, here in the U.S., there's a shortage of tradespeople, sort of in general, and then more so, of course, in these highly specialized trades. It's an ongoing battle here to get young people interested in this type of work and educate them on the importance of it. Is that a struggle in your field? Yeah, yeah, absolutely the same, particularly in fashion. So the way the school system works, it's, it's more focused on getting kids to university and, and that sort of way. Not necessarily every kid is suited to that career path. Um, and so the trades have been neglected in recent years. Thatchian traditionally, before the 1970s, particularly before the 1970s, was a, it was a, a family trade. So you, you, it'd be father to son passed down. Uh, it'd be very difficult for anyone else who didn't have any family connections to get involved. And that's why you, when you look in the UK and you look for a thatch, you'll see a lot of them will say 
fifth generation Thatcher, sixth generation Thatcher. The vast majority would say that, and that, that harks back to that period of time. From the 1970s onwards, there was a sort of a career drive. One particular businessman came in and, and realised there was a shortage and trained a lot of guys up. And there was a big career push for Thatcher. And since then, it's dwindled back down again. So we've got a lot of people then who have set up in, in, in the 70s. And now they, you know, we're, they're all approaching retirement age. And you, you haven't got that next generation coming through. I'm a part of the National Thatcher's Association in the UK. And they have a, um, an apprentice scheme. So where school leavers can, can join up and then they learn the craft over a four-year period. And I think at the moment, there's 15 kids enrolled on that. And I think last time I looked, I think it was between 50 and 60,000 tax cottages in the UK. That's a lot of work between 15 people. Yeah, there's, there's a massive shortage. I mean, I'm sure there's other predators coming on that aren't necessarily going through that scheme. But even so, I think there is a shortage and it, it, it does need addressing it at some point. But it's very hard to do it. The system is not geared up for for that way, that way. Do you work alone or do you have other people that work with you on these projects? No, so I work with, I have an apprentice myself, Jack, and he's been in fashion for, he's working with me two years. So he's halfway through his apprenticeship. And then I have another guy, Mike, who I've worked with for a number of years now. When I left my dad, um, dad's still fashion, but he's sort of picking and choosing work. He's He's in his late 60s. He, he slowed down a lot. So when I left my, my, my dad, I worked on my own for a little while, um, about five years, worked on my own, which was incredibly hard work, faction on your own, because it's, it, it's, there's a lot of labour involved. Are there any women in this field? Yeah, there are. Um, there's, there's a few. Not It's predominantly male orientated, but there, there are a few. I know of probably three or four women women thatchers. Um, there's no reason, no reason why... It, Women can't do it. It suits both sexes. Sometimes it's just what we're conditioned to know or do or be led towards or drawn towards, you know, as children. So I was just curious how it looked, how the field looked at this point. As life is progressing, as the world is progressing, if there were women in it. But do you picture your children maybe becoming third generation Thatchers? Possibly. I would think, going back to women, and I think my daughter would be more likely than my sons, to be honest. She's very, very keen and she's very artistic. So I think possibly my, my two my two sons, they're very academic and I think that they want to go down that route. So Just have to see how it unfolds, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I haven't pushed them into something because it wasn't anything my dad pushed me into. It was something that I wanted to do and follow him. So it's something, if they want to follow me into it, then absolutely there's a job there for them. But if they want to forge their own career path, then absolutely as well. I understand that. As a mother, I have four kids. And if I tried to force them into a career, it would just be a disaster. So (laughs) (laughs) letting them understand it's what they want first is always the uh, greatest path to success, I think. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I can't possibly end this interview before hearing about a specific event that you mentioned to me a few weeks ago, because you and I were emailing back and forth to schedule this interview, and you asked if we could push it out to late spring because you were, and I quote, prepping for a formal dinner and a small exhibition of my work at St. James Palace, one of the three royal palaces in London. And then this, of course, was eventually followed with a photo of you shaking hands with Prince Charles. No big deal, right? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So tell me about that night. How did you end up at dinner with royalty or does everyone in England just bump into Prince Charles at some point in their life? <laughs> yeah, it was a fantastic evening. It was a uh, yeah, once in a lifetime. And that, that, that harks back to a charity that I'm involved in called Kest. And that's the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Trust. They're a charity that is promoting excellence in British craftsmanship. So they sponsor apprentices to go through whatever craft they're going through. They have a, thatching is one of them, but they've got things from textiles, stone masonry to jewellery. And it was their 30th anniversary of the founding of the, of the charity. And Prince Charles is the patron of the charity. And so he, as the celebration of the 30th anniversary, he hosted hosted it at, um, at St. James's Palace. And I was fortunate to be one of the 10 people that they chose to exhibit the work and to show His Royal Highness 
where the money goes to from from the charity. So you were there with about 10 other people. You were invited there and you had to, I guess, had dinner and then you shook hands with Prince Charles. That's pretty amazing. You said once in a lifetime. So you... Yeah. So there was, there's was 10, 10, 10 craftspeople invited and then there was the donors, so the, the business donors who contribute towards the charity. So that it was their meeting to see what the craftspeople are up to. And it was a ch- chance for us crafts guys to, to meet the donors as well. We did a small exhibit of the works just a few photographs that we had and a little duckling I made. And his Royal Highness came around and, and, and spoke to us all. And he was absolutely fascinated with what we were doing. He was really interested at, and actually had a lot of knowledge as well, which I was, I was pleasantly surprised about. What a neat opportunity and, and good for you. Oh, yeah, it was absolutely brilliant. Well, today has been so lovely, and it's really been a pleasure chatting with you and learning more about thatching. I feel like my questions were super basic, like maybe you were over there kind of rolling your eyes thinking, doesn't everybody know this? But this is all so new for me and most of my listeners in the United, in the United States, so I appreciate you indulging those types of oh, questions. you're welcome. You're welcome. Well, before we say goodbye, please tell us where we can find out more about you and also about your work. Yeah, so you can, you can find me on Instagram at Village Thatcher. You can find me on my website, uh, masterthatcher.org.uk. And you can find me on Facebook. And you can find me on Twitter as well, Village Thatcher on Twitter. All right, excellent. I'm going to put all of that in the show notes too. So if anybody listening forgets where to find you, it'll be right on the website and directly in the show notes too. Perfect, thank you. Well, I'll be happily following along with your projects on Instagram, and I'll be adding a trip to the Cotswolds to my travel list to hopefully someday see your work in person, because I think that would be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. You should do. Yeah, Cotswolds is a stunning part of the world. Absolutely beautiful. Again, thank you so much for being here. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening to True Tales from Old Houses, and thank you to my guests, Jason Lamb and Jill Thornton. If you have a moment, I would love it if you would leave a positive rating or review wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Ratings and reviews make the podcast world go round. And to continue the conversation, be sure to follow True Tales from Old Houses and Blake Hill House on Facebook and Instagram. For bonus content and special offerings, please consider becoming a subscriber on our brand new Patreon. And if you're looking for more information about this episode, including photos, show notes, coupon codes, and to request a transcript, visit truetalesfromoldhouses.com. Until next time.